Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Katherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this really tough question. Does godly parenting always produce godly kids or kids who seek the Lord? <laughs> this is such a hard question, moms and dads. That highlights a really deep pain point for so many parents right now. We are in a two-part series gleaning parenting wisdom from the book of Daniel about raising kids in a godless culture. But as we will talk about today, there is no formula. There is no five or 10 or even 20 step program to raising godly kids. We have our part to play as parents. And frankly, <laughs> that's all we can control. But we cannot choose the faith for our kids. So what happens when we do our part as parents? We are diligent about training our kids biblically. The spiritual formation of our children is first and foremost in our minds, and we get a different result than the one we were expecting. That's the ground we cover in this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. So let's get started. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, moms and dads, on whatever app you are listening on, and head over to katherinesegers.com to get a ton of free resources, like my Prodigal Parenting Bundle, which contains all of my podcasts, my articles, and scripture list carefully curated for parents of prodigal kids. It is a free resource for subscribing on my website. We are concluding our rich conversation with DJ Harry today. DJ is a husband and a father of four. He is also a pastor and a speaker and a podcaster. DJ and his wife, Lori, host the Better Together podcast, which focuses on marriage and parenting relationships. Really awesome podcast. You should definitely check it out. If you missed the last episode where we started this conversation about raising godly kids in a godless culture, I highly recommend that you give that one a listen. We are immersed in the book of Daniel and gleaning all the parenting wisdom we can get from this book, which has so much to teach us about godly parenting, especially in a culture that is so anti-God. But as I mentioned at the conclusion of the last episode, our conversation went somewhere that I did not expect in today's episode. As DJ and I discussed these powerful parenting lessons from the book of Daniel, we ended up talking about the reality that many parents are facing right now, parents who have been intentional about parenting their kids in a biblical way. They have prioritized the spiritual formation of their children's lives. They have gone to church, but they didn't leave the responsibility up to the church or the pastor or the youth pastor. They have had the deep conversations. They have done the devotionals. They have taught the Bible stories and learned all the scriptures. Many of them have sent their kids to Christian schools or even homeschooled, and still their child doubts. Their child wanders. Their child takes a different path, perhaps the prodigal path. In other words, to the best of their flawed ability, because no one parents perfectly, they did what Daniel's parents did. And they got a very different result. What then? Okay, so this isn't my whole conversation with DJ, because like I said, it wasn't planned. But that is where we went as we unpack the great parenting wisdom we find in the book of Daniel. One more thing. Be sure to stick around until the end of the episode. I have some very important final thoughts on what turned out to be a very unexpected, personal, and revealing conversation. So with that said, let's jump right in. Welcome back, DJ. It's so nice to have you back on Christian Parent Crazy World. 
Catherine, I can't believe we're already back for a second episode. <laughs> I know. Well, that conversation was so rich, so deep that I'm like, I want us to keep going, but I want to respect the audience time and your time as well. So let's jump back into this. We have been talking about the life of Daniel and the amazing principles that we and guidance that we can get as parents about how to train our children in such a way that they will be able to stand strong in, in this godless culture, but not only to stand strong, but also to make a difference. So we had a couple of principles in the last episode. Why don't you review those really quickly and we'll just keep going. Sure. So we're in the book of Daniel. We're talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their preparation to be able to stand for 70 years plus in a godless culture. And the first thing we saw was in Daniel chapter one, verse one, we don't get to choose when our children's faith will be tested. And you added an excellent point, And we don't get to choose how their faith is going to be tested either. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Catherine, our children's faith is being tested in ways that we never expected when we were their age. Like the things that they're going through now, it is mind boggling the things that they're being challenged on. So we don't get to choose that. We didn't imagine this five years ago, much less, nope, well, maybe 10 years. It's been on the horizon, but yeah, you're so right. I never imagined this. In 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court mandated or stated that same-sex marriage was protected. That was in 2015. Right. And within just a year, the conversation completely changed over to transgender rights and now that has just become the norm in our culture. In a matter of 10 years, that's just completely taken over our culture. You so. know what? I was on a call last night where we were talking about legislation where a parent, a father, had lost custody rights to a two-year-old, mm. a two-year-old whose mother wanted to transition the child. That's where we are. We never imagined that seven years. And I don't have all the details. I can try to find out what that is. Because sure. I was asking, we were in a prayer call and we sure. were talking about it. But I mean, we I see this Alliance Defending Freedom yep. is mm -hmm. taking up a lot of these cases, which I'd really like to get someone on to talk about some of these cases and what's happening with parental rights across our country. Because it's rapidly getting to the place where we don't even have the right to teach our children the way that we want to. It's becoming increasingly more and more important to either privately educate your kids or to homeschool your kids. I know that's not feasible for everyone, and I, I think God will make a way for you to train your child in the way they need to be trained, no matter what, sure. you, you know, whether that's in public, private, or homeschool. But yeah, I mean, that's the sort of stuff that's happening in our culture right now, where parental rights are being taken away if you are not bowing to the God of our culture that says you can choose. And in that instance, that child isn't choosing that. That's sure. a mother choosing that. Yeah, no a mother choosing that. I yeah. mean, there's no way that a child needs to be transitioning at the age of two, or at any age, in my opinion. Yeah. But if they do, come on. Yeah. So that was number one. Number two, which you kind of just hit on, which was excellent, that Daniel was well had a well-rounded education. And that's mm -hmm. a necessary part of training our children to stand. We see that in Daniel 1, verse 4, just that Daniel was well-rounded in his education. He was cunning in wisdom and science and knowledge and had the ability to stand in the king's palace and learning. So all of these things, and it's not telling us what we need to teach our kids, but we sort of talked about the value in your last episode. We talked about the value of teaching your children how to learn so that they can become investigators in life. And so they in turn will seek out learning and continue to grow and you never know where they're going to land, how God's going to use that to help them become a leader in their area. A well-rounded education is a very important part. So that leads us then to the third one. And so, Catherine, we can just go right in if you're good with mm -hmm. that. Yep. The third lesson we learned from Daniel is that there had to be an intentional transfer of faith from Daniel's parents to Daniel. Now, I want to qualify what we're talking about there. We're not talking about a mechanical or a traditional, by, by tradition is what I mean there, a transfer of traditions. So often we think that going to church, which kids, why do we go to church? It's because that's what we always do on Sunday, mm -hmm. that that is a transfer of faith. That's not what we're talking about here mm -hmm. because Catherine, you and I and your listeners have all known families or known people that grew up in church, 
And when they were able to walk away from church at 18 or 20, they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. The tradition of going to church, that's not a transfer of faith. The tradition of reading your Bible, that's not a transfer of faith. There has to be a heart connection that your child has with God. In fact, I say it this way. My wife and I say it this way. There has to be a point where your God becomes their God. No, your God, your relationship with the Lord has to become their relationship with the Lord. And we see that in verse number eight. I think we can infer this in verse number eight, where it says in Daniel one, verse eight, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. So Daniel knew what the law was. Daniel knew the teachings of the law. He knew what a good Jewish person should do in that situation. Why? Because mom and dad had been faithful in teaching that to him. They had been faithful in teaching. I never think about this transfer of faith without thinking about Deuteronomy chapter 6, hmm. which is a wonderful passage, and I'm going to read it. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And here's the part that's important. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I believe Daniel's parents did that successfully. Mm -hmm. It's not, well, the youth pastor will raise my kids. Mm -hmm. And yes, my wife and I grew up Yes, my wife and I were Christian school teachers, but let me tell you what, the Christian school system will do a terrible job raising your children. It's not the Christian school's responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not children church's responsibility. It's not the pastor's responsibility. It's mom and dad's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I believe Daniel, Daniel's parents did a wonderful job transferring their faith to Daniel. And I believe the evidence of that is as Daniel stands before the king and Daniel stands before the princes, he knows as a follower of Jehovah, this is what I should should and should not be doing. And he was willing to act on that. Mm -hmm. His incredible faith that Daniel had that did not come by accident. I believe his parents intentionally had transferred that over to him. And that's a process. You know, as parents, that's a long process. It starts when our kids are really young. And we begin the intentional process of bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We have to demonstrate and we have to, by our own testimony, we have to live out our faith in front of our kids. I believe children that grow up in a home where mom and dad are consistent in their walk with the Lord and they discipline biblically, I think those children naturally should come to a point where they want to understand and they want to know who Jesus is. If they're taught, I believe that's sort of a, how do I say this? If a child grows up in a home where they see their faith modeled in mom and dad, then what they're taught in church and what they're taught as they read through their Bible, and it just should make sense. It clicks. Now, it doesn't mean it's automatic. A child in that circumstance doesn't automatically become a Christian. But I do think they are being guided down a path that points them toward Christ. And I don't think it should be surprising when a child that's four or five years old begins asking questions about the Lord and eternity, and because there should be a hunger that comes up in them. Jesus said, except, except you have the faith of a little child, you will not enter into the kingdom. So there's this wonderful transfer of faith that starts early on. And obviously, Daniel's parents were very successful in that because he had the faith to stand when he was faced with those trials. Yeah, I think one thing I would draw a distinction between, I would say that we do need, it's our responsibility as parents to transfer it, to give it. We're not able to do the receiving. That the child themselves has to make that choice at some point. I, I walk yes. along with a lot of parents and have had parents on here who I know I've walked many, many years and had many, many long drawn out prayer meetings with them. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, they did all of that. And then the child got to Babylon and bowed. And one thing I can say, 
without question is that the foundation they laid is the foundation that child is, can come back to. And sure, I believe absolutely. will come back to as they're prayed for and interceded for the children that it, because it is a fierce culture and we don't know. We don't know even in, in Daniel's we don't hear what happened to those others. Maybe they saw those young men in the fire, praise God, that were not consumed by the fire and they remembered. Maybe there were some that did, Maybe. that were yeah. stirred. I hope so. But I know a lot of parents do the diligent work of the transfer. And for whatever reason, a child chooses not to receive it or has a time of wandering. That's why the Lord put that story of the prodigal child in our scripture, mm -hmm. you know, in the gospels. And he himself was a perfect parent in the garden and had two children that rebelled. Sure. So it's not automatic. It's You can't just, you know, expect that if I do A, B, and C, I'm going to get X, Y, and Z. It doesn't work that way. But the foundation that we lay it's my prayer. I've prayed every day that my children would accept that faith and never depart from it. But even if they do have a time of wandering, I know that I've laid the right foundation and I've been responsible before God. I wasn't a perfect parent, but I've transferred the faith. And I love that scripture in Deuteronomy 6. There's a similar passage in Deuteronomy 11 that I quote a lot. It's just, I think it's an echo where we're told to fix these words of God in our hearts mm -hmm. and minds and to tie them as symbols on our hands. They used to walk around with the scripture on them and to bind them on our forehead, to teach them to our children, talking about them as we sit at home and as we walk along the road, as we lie down and as we get up, to write them on the door frames of our houses. And over the door frame of my house, I have Psalm 91, and we've memorized that Psalm. And on our gates, that's the next part, so that our days and the days of our children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give to their ancestors, as many as the days oh, it's beautiful. that the heavens are above the earth. We are to fix these words of God's in our heart. And that's our job. That's what we can do as we lie down, as we get up, as we walk along the road, as we're in the car, as we're going to soccer practice, or as we're going to school, or as we're going to church, to have those conversations mm -hmm. and to plant the seeds. And we're not responsible for the seed to actually grow. Mm -hmm. That's out of our hands. But we're to plant the seeds. And I believe, like you said, that if we plant the seeds and we're faithful to tend those seeds, that even if there is a dormant period and the seed isn't coming up right when we want it to and we're worried about where they are, that we just keep praying over that seed and interceding over that seed and prophesying over that seed and declaring over that seed that this foundation, that God's word will not return void. It will not return void. So I love that. The, just this, we have to be intentional. We can't sure. leave this to the pastor. As wonderful as a pastor as you are, it's not your <laughs> responsibility to transfer it to every child mm -mm. in your congregation. Mm -mm. It's your responsibility to transfer it to your children. And it's right. my responsibility to transfer it to my children and then to tend those little seeds and to pray over them until they get to maturity and they stand Sure. Strong. Yeah. And it's not like you said, it's not a mechanical transfer. It's a relational transfer. Yes. You are building a relationship with your child so that they can see that your God is so real to you that it creates in them a hunger to know who your God is. But I do, I agree with you 100%, Catherine, that verse in Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, is a wonderful proverb. It is. And you're, we have to remember, Proverbs are wonderful sayings of truth and wisdom that describe how life should be. <laughs> and the reality is that does describe how life should be, but that doesn't always describe how life truly is. It's not a promise. You know, the book of Proverbs also tells us that if you bless the Lord and honor him with your life, you'll be blessed for all your days. I mean, that's a Proverbs as well. But you go just a few books later and you hit Job's life. Yeah. You go at the next book and you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, which is one of the more sobering books. It really is. Which is simply, which I just preached a series through that, though, and it was so wonderful for our church to step back and realize, okay, so the hardness that I'm going through in life, even though it seems unfair and difficult, Solomon came to the conclusion that if we take our eyes off of this world and if we set our eyes toward the heavens, it gives purpose to the difficulty and purpose mm -hmm. to the hardship. 
And so, but it doesn't always turn out how you want. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes tells us that often the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. It's just what happens. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to parenting, even if we did everything right, which we don't, but even if we did everything right, our children still have to answer that call. They have to choose to follow after Christ. And that doesn't always happen. And Catherine, I want to pause and say, I'm thankful that you are tender toward that. It's it's been multiple times now. You have mentioned that, whether it's been an email or in the first episode or in this episode, toward the reality of the difficulties of parenting. And thank you for being tender toward that, because so often pastors, podcast speakers, seminar speakers, we stand up here and we pretend like if you just do what I say, it will always turn out right. And that's just not reality because we're broken humans and we live in a broken world. And I'm thankful that that's something that you communicate clearly to your listeners. It's so important. Can I say something here? I don't even know if I should say this. I'm tender towards that because I'm walking through that. I did everything. I homeschooled. I taught the scriptures. I loved. I prayed. My husband did too. But I have one child who's going through a season of doubt. And I've actually asked that child, can I talk about this? When I started this show three years ago, they were solid in their faith. They are not now. They were in homeschool circles, youth groups, everywhere we went. There were some toxic influences, and we prayed, and we sought godly counsel, and we said, God, where do we go? What do we do? And there is a season of doubt here in this child where they don't know what they believe, despite our best efforts. And I haven't talked about that on this show before. That's why I'm tender. I was tender before because I had deep relationships with parents that I knew these were people I'd walked with, and I knew how they trained their children. I, you know, These weren't superficial relationships. But they were homeschooling right along me. Some of them were on the mission field. Some of them were pastors. I knew how they trained their kids. I'd walked with them. I haven't been a perfect parent. It's been a tough road. And I am committed to praying daily. I created a list of scriptures for children, for parents whose children are struggling in their faith. I didn't even realize when I created it that I would be praying those scriptures over my own child every day. And I do every day without fail. I pray five pages of scripture over my child, and so does my husband. Those words are becoming words that I've memorized. And I don't have the end of the story yet, but I'm tender because I, at one point, I'll just confess to you, DJ, I thought if I dotted all my I's and I crossed all the T's in my parenting, that I would get a different result. And I didn't. And there are times when I've just, like, God, what happened there? But I can tell you this, the story's not done yet. Amen. And I pray over my child, and I know that my prayers and the words that I planted in this child, because this child memorized that scripture, Psalm 91, right along with us, and all of these verses. This child is just a brilliant, deep thinker and questions a lot of things. And I can't force an experience with God onto a child. All I can do is Mm -hmm. pray that they will come to the end of themselves and encounter God where they are and receive God where they are. I didn't really expect to go here today, TJ. (laughs) And I didn't have my Kleenex ready, but there you have it. Well, but before we go, I know we wouldn't normally do this in the middle of a podcast. Can we pause and pray? Sure. I always pray. I pray all the time. I pray day and night. Lord, I, I just pause and say thank you for Catherine and her husband and their love for their children. Lord, I pray specifically during this time of trial that you would give wisdom to them. Lord, it's so easy as we minister to other people to never expect the trials to come in our own life. And Lord, I just pray that you would, in your mercy, just reach down and and do a special work in their family. Lord, the foundation of truth and the foundation of biblical teaching that they've passed along to their children I pray that that would be the soil through which solid faith would grow through. And Lord, we just, we do pray for your hand of protection. It is so easy at this time for Satan to begin attacking. 
And Lord, we just pray that you would do your will and do your work. And Lord, again, thank you for how good you are to us, even though we often fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, DJ. I appreciate that. You've got one more principle that we can take from the book of Daniel. Why don't we bring this one home with that last principle we can learn? Absolutely. So that number three was that we want to, there has to be that transfer of faith. Number four is that it kind of comes up in Daniel chapter one, verse number eight and nine as well. So in verse number eight, it says, therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And then in verse number 11 and 12, Daniel actually asks for an exception. Daniel was standing in front of the rulers of Babylon, and they were telling him, here's what you have to eat. Here's how you have to live. Because for three years, it was a three-year indoctrination period. And I don't know that people remember that, Catherine, Mm -hmm. but it was a three-year indoctrination period that these young men were going to be indoctrinated to become good young Babylonian men and to become leaders. And during that time, Daniel said, I cannot eat this meat because it would violate my faith. It would violate my conscience. Now, what we often do when this happens to our children is they come home and they say, mom or dad, this happened at school or this happened in the workplace. And our tendency, well, my tendency, okay, I'll, I'll make this personal. My tendency, my wife's tendency is we so easily want to jump in and we want to fix the problems. But there comes a point where our children have to know how to appeal to their authorities when something has gone wrong that they cannot control. So I think that's the fourth one. Daniel knew how to appeal to his ungodly authorities. Daniel did not go in and and shout that he had the right not to eat the food. Daniel did not get angry. Daniel did not go in and quit. Daniel chose to stand up for his faith, but to do it in a way that communicated his faith well. And it's interesting that though they did not understand they made accommodations for him. Mm -hmm. Though they did not understand Daniel's faith, they said, no, Daniel, if you don't eat this meat, then you're going to be sickly and the king's going to be upset with us. And Daniel said, give me a week and I promise you, I will be more healthy than everyone else is. Let me eat what I need to eat. And I think we do a disservice when we fight all of our children's battles for them. Now, obviously, there are times when we have to step in. And Catherine, that is age appropriate. Obviously, the the younger they are, the more we have to guide and shepherd them in life. Mm -hmm. But as our children get older, there does come a point where we need to coach them along or teach them how to be able to fight their battles, you know, in an age appropriate way, but how to fight their battles without us having to fight those battles for them. Mm -hmm. Because... When your kids go off to college or when they get into the workplace, I'll tell you what, the the best thing that has helped us with this, Catherine, has been our children working at (laughs) Chick-fil-A. At one point, all four of our kids worked at Chick-fil-A for a brief time during one summer. But right now, Andrew's coming home from college. He'll be working. Emma will be working. And then Laurel works 30 hours a week. We homeschool. We get all of her school done by noon. She works almost every evening. She loves working there. Saved up enough money to buy herself a car a couple of weeks ago, which is awesome. Uh, And she's only 16 years old. Like she just loves saving money and she's very responsible with her finances. But one of the best things for our kids has been letting them be in the secular workforce Mm -hmm. because they are confronted with people who have different ideas and different perspectives on the world people who have different moral values. They come home, they ask questions, we talk. Every night at dinner, for three years while our kids all worked at Chick-fil-A, every night at dinner, we would sit at home and we would talk about what questions came up in work today. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say? How do we respond to that? How do we speak the truth but show the love of Christ? And we constantly were going through those things. And I don't think our kids would have been as far along as they are if we had sheltered them from actually being in some type of an atmosphere where they have to take a stand for their faith. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you want it to be an opportunity where they're going to succeed. 
where they can be successful in that stand. But Daniel knew how to appeal to his authorities. And so that's a very important lesson for us as parents is to train our kids to be able to take a stand when we can then help them along in that process. Mm. We're a Chick-fil-A family, too. We've got one of our kids (laughs) working there. And another kid, you know, that's inspired me a little bit. My second child, he works with his uncle, who is, of course, a believer. Well, of course, not everybody's uncle is, but his uncle is. And he has a lawn care company. But I'm like, maybe we need to find some places for him to get out. He's not 16 yet, but, you know, get out and be in the secular workforce. That is true because they're going to encounter people with different ideas. And we need to, especially a lot of the kids, uh, parents in the audience may have kids being educated in the public school system, they're encountering this every day. But for those parents who do have their kids, we can isolate them too much if they're homeschooled or if they're in a Christian school setting. If, you know, that is a wonderful thing to get them out there, to have them engaging with those ideas and then bringing it back home. I love your idea there where you're sitting around the table and powwowing about, okay, what happened today? What ideas were you presented with? Mm-hmm. Who are these other people in your life? And what might they believe? And how can we compassionately and truthfully sure. share our faith with others? Because people are hungry, not just for Chick-fil-A sandwiches, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Another area that has come up, though, at the workplace, and Chick-fil-A is known if the world would look at Chick-fil-A and say it's a Christian company. Yeah. But the reality is when you get into the workplace, you have a variety of people that are working. And so there is, though, a number of people that work there that come from a variety of religious backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And that also has been really good for our kids because they have been challenged in what they believe from other people who believe differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing if a person who's secular, who believes nothing about the Bible, if they challenge you, well, then you could say, well, I believe the moon's made of cheese. And they'll say, well, I just don't believe that. But if another Christian comes to you and says, well, what do you believe about this? Well, clearly they have scripture that they're using. You have scripture that you're using. And it has really challenged our kids to rightly divide the word because they've had to be able to articulate to other people who have a baseline understanding of Christianity, what they believe and why they believe and why they believe it. And that's been an excellent challenge for our kids as well. Mm, That is so good. You know, one thing I wanted to mention about what happens in the book of Daniel to these three young men along with Daniel is the moment they get to Babylon, what does Babylon do? They change their names. Mm -hmm. And that is what the world, our culture is seeking to do with our kids. You have Daniel, who was renamed his name, his name. Belteshazzar. It's in verse number eight, verse number seven. I was looking for their name meanings. I'd written them up here. I have Mm -hmm. them right here. Okay. Belteshazzar, that actually means Baal protects the king, whereas Mm -hmm. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah became Shadrach. Hananiah means grace, mercy, gift of the Lord, whereas Shadrach means command of Akhu, who is the Babylonian god of the moon. Mishael becomes Meshach. Mishael means who is like God. What a beautiful name meaning who is like our Lord. But Meshach means belonging to Aku, which is the God of the moon. And then Azariah is helped by God, whereas Abednego is servant of Nego, meaning the Babylonian God of wisdom. So that's what's going to happen as our children get out there in this Babylonian Mm -hmm. culture is that the enemy is going to come. And he's going to want to change their identity, change their name, change their standard. That's what he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. These are the things you should be eating. This is what you should be consuming. That's what the world is going to say. And our hope and our prayer is as we've taught our children, and I've got I'm sitting here with all of these children under my nest, and I see some that are flourishing, and I've got this one, as I just mentioned, who is struggling in the faith. But we have prepared them with the truth of who God says they are. Sure. They do know this. And I trust, I am praying fervently for my one child who's struggling to come and have an encounter with God. But the truth of who our children is, their identity in Christ is where 
we need to spend a lot of time transferring that idea to them because the world, the second they get out and into the world, it's going to transfer that idea of who they are and rewrite their name, rewrite who they are, their purpose and their meaning in life. And Daniel is one really great place to camp as parents. I'm so glad that you've unpacked this for us. Tell us again where they can learn more about you and your podcast, DJ, and get in touch with you if they want to. Absolutely. So our website is growingbettertogether.org. And our podcast is Growing Better Together with DJ and Lori. And of course, we're on Facebook and other things like that, other social media outlets. But honestly, if people are just want to come listen to our podcast, that's really what we would enjoy But Catherine, I want to let you know how much I have just absolutely enjoyed talking with you. This has been such a blessing. I know. This went way longer than we planned. It's awesome. And I want to highlight one thing that I think is important. Even those who had the closest relationship with Jesus Christ, the 12 disciples, Mm -hmm. even among those, when Christ was crucified, only one stood around. You had multiple that walked away that were doubting and questioning. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until after the resurrection that Jesus came to Peter and the other men as they were fishing and he was on the seashore and they see him walking. And Peter says, is that our Lord? And he throws off his jacket and he swims as Peter always does in the scripture. He just with reckless abandon swims to the savior. And it's at that point that Jesus looks in Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And I'm so thankful that even when our children stray from where we want them to be and where we hope they would be, our Heavenly Father hasn't changed where he is. He's still right there saying, I love you. I welcome you back. And I want you to know my prayer will be, me and my wife, our prayer will be that God will do a work in your family And But I'm thankful that God is right there. He is. And he's right there with y'all as well. And though sometimes as as parents, we go through times of hardship, we have a faithful God. And I'm so thankful for that. I am too. I've grown a lot. I've learned a lot. My husband and I are completely united. And, you know, we have a, here's one thing I can attest to. We have a really great relationship with all of our kids, even our kid who's struggling in their faith. We have a really great, and like I said, I I actually asked this child recently, can I talk about that sometime? I have a podcast about this for heaven's sake. (laughs) And they're like, you know, I've been very sensitive because I don't want to ever do anything that would damage my relationship with my child. That's a paramount importance to me. But my child said, sure, that's okay. That's okay. It's where I am. And so we're walking through this faithfully, along with a lot of my listeners. I get more emails about that than anything else. And I will say I was always sensitive to this, even before it became part of my own journey. And I don't know exactly why it's become part of my journey. But Mm -hmm. I think I do know why, because we raise these little beautiful human beings, but they're autonomous creatures. God gave them free will. We cannot... We cannot coerce them. We cannot convict them that God's job to convict. It's the enemy's job that coerces. We're supposed to guide them and to love them unconditionally and to point them towards the truth. And that's where we are with all of our kids. And for whatever reason, you know, we have kids that are really flourishing in their faith and then one who's struggling. But praise God, we're encouraged and we stay in the word every day and we pray faithfully for our child. And and I've really enjoyed this time with you as well. I honestly, I didn't know that we were going to talk about that today. (laughs) And I was kind of debating in the middle of it. Do I go here? Do I go here? I don't know. But I think, you know, at some point I knew I was going to talk about it probably on the show. It's where I've been for, we've been going through this for about eight months now, I think. So anyways, for whatever reason, I guess the God, God chose you, DJ. Well, praise (laughs) the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> to, to have that conversation and to guide us along. And I do want to encourage people to go to your website and to listen to your podcast. I was listening to one last night. That is awesome. And I was telling you before the show, I want you to come back on Okay. in 2024 sometime. I really want you to come back on. It's seven ways to win every argument with your spouse and lose your marriage. Absolutely. You can do it. You can win the argument. You sure can. It uh-huh. was so good. 
So why don't next time we get together? Okay, I'm going to be on your show in a little bit talking about ways we can help our kids to be countercultural. Yes, and I'm so looking forward to that. I'm very excited about that. I've written on that and podcasted on that before. But if you'll commit, maybe at the same time we can tag team if we don't talk too long. (laughs) <laughs> so we just keep going. But have you back on to talk about those seven ways to win every argument with your spouse and lose your marriage? We'd love to do it. I was a little convicted with a few though. So I was like, ooh, I've done that. Ooh, I've done that. So I'd love to have you back on. Thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. Amen. This has been awesome. So in three years of podcasting, This is by far my rawest interview. It took me by surprise when DJ noted how sensitive I am about the plight of parents of prodigals. And, well, now you know why. But I want to give you a few final thoughts on prodigal parenting. Like I said, never thought we would be here. Even though I knew so many amazing godly parents who have been very intentional about teaching scripture and biblical principles to their kids and engaging with their children on the deep spiritual issues. And this has been their journey. Even still, somehow I thought, (laughs) not me, uh -uh." somewhere deep inside, I did think if I dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's of biblical parenting, I would get a very different result. My kid would not go through a season of doubt or wondering. But as I've said before on this show several times, God is the perfect parent. He had two kids in a garden with an infinite number of good choices that they could make on any given day and only one bad choice. And still they chose the one bad choice. With Perfect parenting. Adam and Eve walked away from God. So if our expectation with godly parenting is not my kid, that'll never happen to me. Well, you'd have to be a better parent than God to get that result every time. And good luck with that, because we are not better parents than God. And look, that kind of thinking can result in a couple of really bad outcomes first. If our child doubts God and leaves the faith, we are in for a very rude awakening that usually ends in blame and shame. It's all my fault or my spouse's fault. And that is so unhelpful and unproductive. The other outcome can be that all of our kids do follow the Lord and we may sit in secret judgment of other parents thinking, well, (laughs) obviously I was more diligent and faithful and strategic and godly than they were. Clearly, I mean, yeah, look at my kids. My kids are following the Lord, whereas their kids, yeah, not so much. Look, moms and dads, if your child is doubting or isn't following the Lord, listen closely. Stop with the blame game. You weren't a perfect parent because no one is but God. And as I just pointed out, his kids rebelled. Mm -hmm. We all make parenting mistakes, but your child's choices are not yours and their choices are not your fault. And if your kids are following the Lord, stop patting yourself on the back. Yes, you know, you may have worked hard in the spiritual formation of your child, but their response to the Lord <laughs> wasn't up to you either. The work he does in your kid's heart is his doing, not yours. You know, I want to tell you a really quick story. I had a friend in high school named Miriam. Miriam was the butt of every bad joke on our high school campus. She was a little socially awkward. She had no friends except for me. Really, this girl had a tough journey in life. Her parents weren't Christians. They didn't take her to church. And you know, she had a younger sister who got pregnant in high school. But Miriam, she took a very different path. She went to Young Life and I would take her to church and other church functions with me. And Miriam got saved. She came to know the Lord with parents who did nothing to feed her faith, nothing whatsoever. And she she never wandered. She never took the prodigal path despite having prodigal parents. I tell you this not to absolve any of us from our responsibility as parents to train our children in the way they should go, which includes taking to heart these incredible lessons that we can learn from the book of Daniel. That's our job. That is what it means to be a godly parent. But, and here's the big but, the results are not up to us. 
The results are out of our hands. Look, that can be a little disheartening. I know. Trust me. (laughs) I know. But we are not judged by God for our results. Now, let's be honest. We may be judged by other Christians for our results, but not God. No, we are judged by God for our faithfulness. And here's the kicker. Our faithfulness in standing our ground, maintaining that godly witness as our kids go out on their own and follow God or or not follow God, and our faithfulness to pray over our kids every day, that work will not return void. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. (laughs) We don't get to determine the proper time though. God does. That means we may not reap the harvest when we want to, which for every parent is right now, but we don't do the reaping. Our part is not becoming weary in doing Good. Our part is perseverance. Our part is faithfulness and trust in God, the perfect parent who will go to the ends of the earth for our lost child. And we must partner with him. Yeah. By the way, Galatians 6 verse 9 is one of the scriptures I put on my list for prodigal parents. My husband and I know it well because we've been praying it every single day for the last year. So, why exactly are Gen Zers leaving the faith? What does the current research say? And what do you do if your child has left the faith? Like, how do you parent the prodigal child? Those are the questions that I'm going to answer in the next two episodes. I'm actually going to air an interview that Lori Christine did of me on her podcast, Redeeming the Chaos. It's all on parenting the prodigal child. It was such a great interview, and Lori has kindly allowed me to air it here on CPCW. I have danced around this topic quite a bit on this show, but I want to address it again with some first-hand experience. Spoiler alert, prayer is the central part of parenting a child who is wandering from the faith, and you can't pray anything better than straight scripture. That is why I put together a list of scriptures to pray over prodigals. I did that before I had a prodigal myself. That list is actually a part of my prodigal bundle of resources that are completely free. All you have to do is subscribe at katherinesegers.com. If you need some better strategies and encouragement on parenting a prodigal, then get that bundle, pray those scriptures, and be sure to tune in next week. One final note. If this episode touched a pain point and you need a sympathetic ear, please feel free to email me at Catherine at Catherine I really do love hearing from my listeners and I would be honored to hear your story and to pray for you personally. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know There are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh, and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. Uh, Just a thought. Uh, and be sure to check out my website, which is katherineseegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you Your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time.
Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.